Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Luis Rivera. He's going to give uh, the title of his presentation is Trade Issues and Opportunities for the Peanut Industry. Dr. Rivera is a professor and extension and economist in the Department of Agricultural Econo Economics at Texas A&M University. He's the director of the Center for North American Studies and also st serves as the director for international projects with the Agricultural and Food Policy Center. Please welcome Dr. Ribera. All right, thank you. Good morning. Um, just want to make sure that everything is working. Uh, uh, welcome to Texas. Uh, and again, you know, I uh, wish you were, we were able to meet in, in person, but uh, uh, we're going to try to do the best here. I'm going to try to share my screen. Can you all see uh, this presentation? Yes. Is it good? Okay, great. Again, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, some of the things that I was going to discuss, uh, uh, Patrick already went over it, so I'm just going to go through uh, very quickly, and I'm going to spend a little more time on opportunities as I see, and I'm going to second uh, the uh, message that uh, Dr. Stover uh, talked about opportunities for the peanut industry. Talking about the trade, is the trade issues, I always like to start with a, uh, 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 how, how big of an agricultural exporter we are in the, in the, in the trade arena. Uh, we are the largest agricultural exporter in the world with $137 billion in 2019, a little bit below 2018 numbers, but still uh, quite uh, uh, big. The other thing that I always try to point out is the importance of trade. Exports uh, account for about 35% of our agricultural income. Again, you know, more than one third of, uh, of uh, U.S. farm income comes from our overseas market. So uh, they are very important. Uh, anytime that there is any trade issue, trade dispute, it affects usually the U.S. in a negative way. So whenever I saw the, uh, that we were getting over these trade disputes by the end of last year, I was looking forward for, for 2020. Uh, of course, I couldn't predict uh, COVID or coronavirus, but, uh, but anyways. Uh, in terms of imports, uh, we total about 131 billion in 2019 as well. So we import quite a bit as well. That's what uh, you know. Trade is a, is, a, is a back and forth issues, and 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 I I left that trade outlook positive for 2020. But now I put question mark because we really don't know what's going to happen. We've uh, uh, the whole world got hit uh, really hard by COVID, and uh, we'll see what's going to happen. Uh, uh, being an economist means that I'm, I, I talk with numbers, or so you're going to see a lot of numbers and graphs uh, in my presentation. Uh, so, so bear with me on, on, on those. Uh, here I just wanted to show, uh, even though that there's been a, a lot of talk about trade issues and, and uh, uh, tariffs and back and forth, trade in general hasn't changed that much. Now, of course, there's a lot more risk. There's a lot more uncertainty in the market. Uh, prices are, are lower than, than, it, than they were in, in a year or two ago. But, uh, but in terms of uh, quantity and values of trade, we're about the same. And I just wanted to show these are the top uh, markets for U.S. exports with Mexico, Japan, China, Canada, European Union. They account for about 60% of the total. And as you can see, changes from 16 to 18. And 18 is what we're going through when it, with trade issues with, uh, with China started. You saw that in China, there was a big change in the amount of, uh, of the quantity of, uh, of uh, agricultural commodities that we export to that country, lower by about 69%. But at the same time, we have a increase on exports to the European Union. And that's what usually happens with trade, you know, because you cannot adjust your production uh, uh, quickly. Then if we stop sending uh, some uh, products or country, then that means that uh, where was supplying to that country, supplying more, and then we're going to have to supply to uh, uh, cover that hole. This is the case that, uh, with the European Union from 16 to 18, and then changes from 18 to 19. We saw a big increase in uh, exports to China, and then a decrease to exports to European Union and Japan. Again, that's what at the end of 19, we were starting to get 
the uh, uh, the trade agreement with uh, uh, within the phase one trade agreement, then we saw a, a, an increase in, in exports to uh, to China. And the same thing can be seen in terms of value. That's what sometimes we look only on quantity or so, sometimes only look at value, and it tell us different stories. But in general, it tell us the same thing here that. Uh, uh, from 16 to 18, we saw a large decrease uh, to China, increase in other countries or European Union and Japan. And then uh, 18 to 19, we have an increase in China and then decrease in other countries as, as well. As I mentioned, uh, three uh, main trade deals that were signed towards the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020, USMCA agreement, which is, uh, I call it NAFTA plus, because it has most of the things under NAFTA with some changes uh, uh, to, uh, to agriculture. We also got the US-Japan Japan agreement, uh, which is very important as well as, as Patrick was talking about how important that market is for the peanut industry. And also China in the phase one uh, commitment to, uh, uh, to increase the, uh, the amount of, uh, of food purchases that they'll do to, uh, from, from the US, which again, you know, those are very important as well. I wanted to show here, uh, a little bit of, uh, of what we're seeing now with this COVID. This is just um, US exports to main markets from January through May, from 17, 18, 19, and 20. And the last column, the last uh, uh, column, there is changes from 19 to 20. As you can see, overall, we've seen a, a, a decrease in, uh, in agricultural exports to, uh, to these main markets, but China is a positive. Again, you know, a 16 point, and this is in thousands of dollars, a 16 point increase in, uh, in uh, export to China. And this is important because as, I, uh, as you can see on these US exports of peanuts in terms of metric stone from 16 to uh, May of 2020, China is a, it's, it's an important market uh, for the US. And in, in uh, last year, from January to May of 2019, which is this, uh, this uh, bar right there, uh, it got almost reduced to nothing. And we have recovered from, from January to May of 2020. As you can see, we already exported more peanuts to, uh, to, uh, to China than uh, in all 2019 and comparable to the whole year of 2017. So those are positive things that are happening uh, for, uh, for the peanut industry or the peanut uh, uh, export markets, overseas markets that we're, uh, uh, getting uh, getting out there. One thing that I also like to point out is that even though those are positive uh, numbers for China, we're still well below what we're supposed to be getting for uh, uh, under phase one. And, and uh, apologies for, for all these uh, uh, lines here, but let me explain to you the, uh, the, uh, the top one, the uh, dark blue line, it's, uh, it's uh, the uh, 2021 uh, phase one agreement on how much you're supposed to be sending on a monthly basis for uh, for uh, uh, to China under phase one on 2021. So we had to reach all the way to 39 billion uh, worth of agricultural products. Uh, so in order to reach that 39 billion worth of agricultural products, we need to send, you need to be getting about 3.3 billion every, every, uh, every month to reach that value at the end of the year. Now the yellow one is uh, phase one for 2020. So we need to get to about $34 billion do uh, worth of agricultural exports to China. For that, we need to be sending about $2.7 billion on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. Uh, this uh, light blue here, it's uh, 2012. That's, a, that's the, uh, the year that we send the most, uh, uh, the largest amount of agricultural products to China that we reach to about $26 billion. And then the uh, green one here is what we sent into 2019, that we reach about 14 billion. The red one here is what we're sending right now. And as you can see, we're well below, we're above what we sent in 2019. That's why we see a positive uh, number in terms of changes from, a, from, a, from a, uh, 20 to, to, to 2019, okay? But we're well below not only phase two, uh, sorry, phase one 2021 and phase uh, one 2020, but also below the, the year, which is 2012, that we send the most. Now, as you can see, there's a little seasonality here. So we could expect to see an increase uh, in the rate 
of, uh, of exports to China, but we'll see. And again, you know, I want to uh, point out the China because it's such an important market for, for, uh, for, uh, for the peanut industry. And uh, let's move on to, to uh, opportunities as I see. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, we led, the Texas A&M led with, uh, with the um, uh, Normar Borlaug, which is, yeah, he got Nobel Prize for, um, for the Green Revolution. Uh, and we have an institute for him over here. Uh, it basically changed the world in terms of uh, adapting varieties, as starting with wheat to other countries so they can feed themselves. And, uh, and they, call, they call it the Green Revolution. But now, uh, in my view, in, 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 uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new paradigm now. You know, as we're going from the Green Revolution to the Lean Revolution. And let me explain what I, what I mean by that. Uh, over the years, because of uh, technology, uh, we basically use less input to produce the level of outputs that we have. As you can see there, the level of input keeps going down, but our productivity or output level keeps going up. That means that our yields keep going up and the price is going down because we'll be a lot more productive on a, on a per, uh, per, uh, per acre basis. So again, you know, that helps to uh, feed the world better. The price of, 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 of uh, food has gone down. The other thing that I like to point out is that we don't have a lot of, a lot of agricultural land just sitting out there uh, anymore. Uh, one of the countries that kind of can, can still expand their agricultural frontier quite a bit is Brazil. But overall, you know, all the agricultural land that we have is already uh, in production. And uh, in the U.S., it's actually agricultural land goes down uh, than actually goes up because of development increasing on, or on development on, on neighborhoods, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we know that we're going to reach, or, or the projections are by 2050, we're going to reach, reach 10 billion people. Okay, and uh, uh, with, you know, a, a reducing amount of agricultural land, but one thing that is more important uh, than, than just the amount of people that we're getting is, is this, which is the world GDP. It's not only that we're going to get a lot more people, we're going to get a lot more people with money. And that's what China has been so important over the last uh, 15, 20 years. It's not that China just started to have a lot of people there. It always had a lot of people. But the difference now is that now those, that, that pe those people have, have money to purchase things. Okay, so when you have money to purchase things, then you also start changing your diet from grain-based diet to more of a protein-based diet or more specific type of diets, more uh, uh, just, just different. And you can purchase and you can decide what you want to uh, purchase uh, because you have the, uh, the money to do that. That, led, that has led us to... Uh, to this uh, chart here that shows how much different countries, people in different countries spend on food. And these are 2018 numbers. You can see there the US is number one, which means that here in the US, we spend the least amount of money as a percentage of our income on food. We only spend about 6.4% of our disposable income on food at home. This is just food at home, okay? This is the cheapest in the world. Then I, I have highlighted there Canada and Mexico. A lot, I do a lot of my talks on, on, on NAFTA or now USMCA. That's what I haven't highlighted. But Canada has been about 9.1% and Mexico about 23.4%. Uh, okay, this is very important again because with 6.4% of, 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 our, of our money just spent on, on food, that gives us a lot of... Uh, a wiggle room to spend things on, uh, spend money on other things and help the economy. And also because we have covered our necessity with that a little amount of money, then we can invent and we can create different things and new things. Now that is on the positive end, but what is on the negative end? Because it's so, so cheap to get food now, we have a really big problem with obesity in this country. And these are uh, uh, a map from 85 to 2014 you know, 85, 95, 2005, and 2014. And as you can see, this problem is getting worse by a lot. Every time that I watch these, uh, that I see these graphs, I just, you know, get in awe because, I mean, 85 wasn't that long ago. And look how much has changed the problem of obesity from 85 to 2014. Almost every single uh, state in the U.S. have problems with obesity. It's just the, the, how, how big of a problem is, you no. Know, 
not if you have a problem. And, and that is a big problem with, uh, 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 for, uh, for, uh, for our country. And, and the US government spends about $1 trillion in uh, 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 diseases that trying to deal with diseases that are related to, uh, to how we eat. So basically we revalue our, 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 our how, how we eat and we have changed from the pyramid here at the bottom that we've seen it for several, several years now to my plate to try to help uh, uh, consumers to eat healthier, to avoid these, issues, these health issues. Then uh, uh, a few years back also there was a study by a, a professor in Arkansas that decided to rank uh, 40 commercial available fruits and vegetables in terms of their antioxidant uh, value. And, 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 uh, and you probably heard this, but blueberries was the champion. Number one in, 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 in terms of antioxidants and what happened to the berries industry. Berries industry in general, blueberries, but uh, berries industry in general, consumption has gone up quite a bit because of this help uh, benefit, not necessarily for nutrition content, but also with these health related benefits. So I think that's, that's the new paradigm that we have, you know, is to when I said from the green revolution, because we have enough food, uh, at least in this country we do, is that now we, because we have so much, we need to be able, we need to eat healthier and try to add in not only the nutrition part, but also the uh, health related components of that. And that's what I think science can help us quite a bit. These are, I'm just gonna talk a, a couple of minutes of these studies from a colleague of mine that uh, uh, they basically found out that a uh, uh, carrot, for example, has about a tenth on the amount of, uh, of antioxidants than, than uh, uh, blueberries, for example. Uh, that is, you know, this one here, uh, you can see this chart in the middle here, chart B, is the amount of, uh, of uh, antioxidants on, on, on carrots, and it's about, it's about 30 units of antioxidants for a whole carrot. But he found out if you wound the vegetable, if you, you cut it in slices, if you cut it in pies, and if you shred them, and then you put uh, that uh, a carrot in a Ziploc bag in the refrigerator for a couple of days, the amount of antioxidants increases quite a bit, so much that it reaches above the levels of the uh, blueberries. Now, why is this important? Again, you know, carrots are a lot cheaper than blueberries. But, but just by these simple changes in, in, in cutting or, or wounding, as they call it, the, uh, this, uh, this uh, carrot, then you, you can consume as much antioxidants as you're getting uh, from, uh, from consuming blueberries. Again, you know, carrots that are a lot cheaper, you can have, you can market them as a super carrot and, get, uh, and be able to market it better and be able to increase the demand for those products. Those are some, some of the things that I think uh, science can help producers and the industry in general to open up new markets and, and, and open up uh, or increase the demand for this product given some uh, uh, characteristics that, uh, that, uh, that consumers are willing and are able to pay for it because we spend so, so little on food. So then you have uh, uh, news like the Discovery News that tortured vegetables better for you. And then you got uh, the New York Times also very carrots more helpful. And this is not doing any bioprocessing or anything. It's just a simple uh, uh, wounding of the vegetable cutting into pieces. And that's how value the, the know-how or the science can do just to help marketing these products. Another example of that is the uh, peach plums and nectarines. It was found that it helped to fight uh, and, and kill uh, breast cancer cells. Cancer, uh, cells. Uh, again, you know, they did uh, here, it was done here at Texas a and well with lab rats and all that. And it basically shows that peaches plump induce delicious promising death of breast cancer cells. So what do you think happened when this news hit the, uh, the, uh, 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 the news or, or the, uh, the news outlets in 2010? Consumption of stone fruit went high by quite a lot. Okay, so those are, those, those are the things that can help us open up new markets internationally, because again, you know, as I show you with the uh, GDPs uh, of, of the world, uh, they also have more purchasing power, uh, although here in the US we still have uh, the most. Something that will hit home uh, more, it's pecans. Last year, uh, a couple of colleagues of mine got into a, uh, a grant agreement with the uh, Texas pecans uh, producers and, uh, and uh, to find out if there's something that, uh, that uh, besides the nutritional component of pecans to help uh, uh, 
increase the the, uh, the demand for pecans, and they basically found that they hasn't. They already found that out. They haven't uh, got it uh, taken out to the press yet because of this COVID. They're waiting for the right time. But basically, consuming pecans help uh, with diabetes. It works uh, uh, the same as met metformin. Uh, that uh, that it helps. Uh, 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 it has the ability to revert insulin resistance and glucose sensitivity muscle. So basically, the same as is met 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 uh, uh, formin. So. You can expect that whenever this hit the, uh, the, uh, the news outlet, it's gonna be big. And also they're working with the Human Behavior Lab here at Texas A&M to, to be able to figure out what's the best way to, to, uh, to have that information out to the public. What type of information can you put it in the, in the containers, for example, so consumers can uh, get it quickly and understand it quickly so they can uh, uh, make their purchase and decision uh, faster. So anyways, I'm running out of time, but I, I just want to leave you with, with this uh, uh, graph that says a, really, a brilliant future for plant natural products uh, because we can use the natural products that we have to help fight many of the uh, uh, foodborne uh, uh, illnesses that, uh, that, uh, that are affecting our, our, our consumers, uh, both domestically and internationally as well. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you want to copy my presentation or anything that I can uh, do to help you, there's my contact information with email, um, phone number. We have a Twitter account also. If you want to follow us, we put a lot of these uh, results of these studies there uh, periodically as well. Uh, with that, I turn it to Gary uh, to have a time for, for a question or, or two. So we did have one question here, Luis. It, uh, the question was, when peanuts are used for oil versus human food, does the value difference impact potential for exports? Repeat, repeat that again, please, Gary. So when peanuts are used for oil versus human food, does the value difference impact the potential for exports? I believe it does. It, again, you know, it depends on, 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 on the, uh, the demand for, for uh, different type or different uh, different yeah different types of uh, of products or by products from the uh, peanut industry. It, it all depends on 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 the demand and uh, uh, you know prices is going to be uh, is set by the market supply and demand and and as we know there's a uh, a demand because of uh, some uh, something that was found on on the oil or 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 something that is found on the for human consumption. Uh, that's just going to trigger prices and it's going to either go up or down depending on, on the availability of the supply. So another question just popped up and it said, in looking at the, the research that was done with the carrots and the pecans and the peaches, uh, do you know of any researchers looking at, at other options for peanut products uh, to, to give these type of results? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, the study that I was adding there was done at our horticultural department here, Dr. Luis Cisneros. And uh, uh, we've, we, uh, we've partnered with him because he does that, uh, that uh, he finds uh, different components that help, uh, that, that are healthy for, for, for consumption either uh, anti-inflammatories or in the case of pecans for help with diabetes. Uh, there's other ones that help with breast cancer and antioxidants and all that. He's able to, uh, through experiments and through uh, uh, running to their lab, they can find you know, specific things that can help the promotion of those products. And we've partnered, with, and he has partnered with us in the Ag Economics Department because we also want to, two things. One is to measure that impact, to show the return on investment on, on research for this type of uh, analysis. But at the same time, on the, with our marketing group on our Ag Economics Department, which is a human behavioral lab, to figure out what's the best way to put that information out there so it's easy to understand. Uh, consumers can understand it easily and they know uh, the benefits of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, whatever, whatever they're trying to, uh, to purchase. because. Because remember, I mean, when, whenever uh, consumers are at a grocery store, they have, you know, uh, one or two seconds to read things. You know, they go through the aisles very quickly. So we want to have that information out there that is synthesized 
in, in, in a way that consumers can understand it easily so they can uh, uh, get their, their attention and also get purchases as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a joint effort that we're doing with, with him. But I think that's the future of uh, um, uh, food marketing because again, you know, we're not only looking for the nutritional component, we're looking for the health issues. And now with, with coronavirus now too, uh, you know, it was really hard to find orange juice or find uh, uh, some uh, uh, products that they were supposed to increase your, your immune system. I think this is the time to, uh, to, uh, to hit, uh, to try to do that, that strategy uh, because there's a demand for it. Yeah, we had two different responses uh, after that question. It actually, it says here that the Peanut Institute is sponsoring a number of studies showing the health benefits of the peanut consumption. So that work is being done. Great. And then there was a, a chat here said, Dr. And I'm going to mess this name up. Resion at UGA showed that wounding peanuts and soaking them in water increase the resveratrol content. So there is work that is going on, uh, which is duplicating some of that work that you showed. That, that is great. I think, I think it's good that that, that, uh, that uh, work is being done. Now the second part, which is how to, uh, uh, get it out because there's a lot of research that goes on in A&M that even I don't know what's going on. I didn't find out about this uh, 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 carrots deal until a couple of years ago. And I've been working for A&M for over 15 years. <laughs> you know, so it's important to have those, uh, those, uh, those uh, studies done, but it's more important to get it out, not only on a journal publication, but also to the general public so they know more and that they can make a, a, a better decision or their deci uh, more informed decisions on what to consume. Well, I appreciate your, your presentation, Luis, uh, and thank you.